So today we celebrate Good Friday. And it is good for us because it is the day that our sins are atoned for by Christ, the High Priest. And Christ is, of course, the ultimate priest, the priest of priests, because his sacrifice is the sacrifice of all sacrifices because it is the one that truly makes a difference. He pays the debt for every sin ever committed. From the first sin of Adam and Eve to the last sin of the last man alive on earth before Christ comes again. Every sin, from the least little sin to the most horrible sins, murder of children and all kinds of things that we can think of that are horrible, even Satanism. Jesus paid the price for all those sins. So whatever sin we've committed, however bad it may be, even the worst of sinners, he has procured for us the grace necessary to pay that debt so that we can be forgiven and enter into the kingdom of heaven. A priest is defined as a bridge between God and man. And that's what Christ is, the bridge between heaven and earth that we may cross over peacefully and finally return to the union with God that was lost through sin. Sin was a great divide, a great spiritual divorce between God and man. So Christ, the priest, comes and he offers the sacrifice. A priest, by definition, offers a sacrifice. A priest, by definition, has an altar and he has a victim. So Christ, the high priest, the true priest, from which everyone else who uses the word priest derives their name from in a, in, a, in a sort of shadowy way because he is the true priest, he offers on the altar of the cross on Good Friday himself as the victim, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he is both the priest and the victim, the one who offers and the offering itself, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. By his stripes, we are healed. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the seven last words of Christ from the cross. And the word seven, when we think about that, that normally conjures up the seven days of creation. Seven is a number of completion. It reminds us of the beginning, God creating the world. And so these seven last words, I think, in a certain way, relate to that. I will make a loose comparison between them. So when God created the world, what does he say first? Let there be light. And so the creation of light... Light actually enables us to see things. Light warms, it purifies, it helps us in many ways. And Christ says, I am the light of the world. The first letter of John says, God is light. And so this light, how do we relate that phrase, let there be light to the first words of Jesus from the cross? Jesus says from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And so the forgiveness of God, that is the whole purpose of the crucifixion to obtain the forgiveness of God and so that light of God's truth God's love God's mercy God's forgiveness comes to us through Christ as he says those seven last words and he says those words which are the ultimate goal of the work he's doing on the cross forgiveness father forgive them for they do not know what they do and so because when we commit a sin, we do so in ignorance. We don't have full knowledge of what we do and all of its effects. We can be forgiven. Thank God for ignorance. 
Because the angels, the evil angels, when they sinned, they knew everything. They knew all the effects and consequences. And don't ask me how they could have made that decision because supposedly they're smarter than we are. Angelic intelligence superior to us somehow, and that's a mystery I think we'll only understand in the next world. Somehow the devil and his angels decided, even though they knew the effects of what would happen to them, even they, though they knew about hell and the separation from God, they still chose evil over good. They chose to turn against God, and that is why they cannot be forgiven. And that is why the demons are angry at us, because we can. And they work hard to take the gift of forgiveness that Jesus gained for us on the cross away from us. They work hard to bring people, places, and things into our lives to get us away from the forgiveness of Christ so that we can be like them, condemned to hell for all eternity. Now God has given us a wonderful thing called a guardian angel who comes to bring people, places, and things into our lives to get us away from sin and into grace, into salvation. So those first words have a lot of power. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And then we see the effect of the cross. Jesus says to the good thief in Luke 23, verse 43, Today you will be with me in paradise. One of the most beautiful lines in scripture. So from forgiveness on the cross follows the gift of paradise that Christ gained for us that day. Christ, the new Adam, undoing what the old Adam did. The old Adam caused us to lose paradise. The new Adam, Christ, brings us the return to paradise. And not just the one that was lost, one even greater. As great as Christ is above Adam, so much greater is the new paradise of God over the old one that we lost with Adam and Eve. The next line we see, Behold your son. Woman, behold your son. And to John, behold your mother. Christ dying on the cross as part of his last will and testament, along with the gifts of forgiveness and paradise, he gives us a wonderful help to the road to heaven in his mother. He makes his disciple John, who represents all of us, his brother. Now notice he doesn't say in their son, behold your mother. He just says, behold your mother. Significant difference because Christ becomes our brother. And then when he dwells within us, Mary becomes our mother. So we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And then we have the same father, God the Father. We have the same mother, Mary. So he said to Mary, woman, behold your son, because she is the new woman, replacing Eve, the first woman. Mary is the new Eve. And so through her obedience to God, she undoes the disobedience of Eve. Eve listened to a fallen angel and brought sin and death. Mary listened to a good angel, the archangel Gabriel, at the Annunciation. She, and she obeyed God, let it be done to me according to the, your word. And through her obedience, she brings grace and redemption. The incarnation of Christ within her womb, the beginning of our salvation. So Mary becomes our mother, and Jesus gives him to her as he's dying on, from the cross. He gives us his mother Mary, along with giving us paradise and forgiveness. He bequeaths to us this wonderful woman to be our spiritual helpmate. So when we pray, she prays for us and with us. The first miracle of Jesus is worked at the wedding feast of Cana through Mary's intercession. She intercedes on behalf of the couple and tells Jesus they have no wine, and he works his first miracle through her request. 
and that is the beauty of devotion to Mary. The Hail Mary prayer, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And so when we pray the Hail Mary prayer, she prays for us and with us, together, the two of us, us sinners on earth and the highest saint in heaven, the queen of angels and saints, the queen of heaven and earth, praying for us and with us, worshiping God together, us and Mary, because Jesus said she is now our mother from the cross. He established a new relationship with all of his disciples and his mother by the power of the word of God, the same word of God that said, let there be light and there was light. The same word of God that took the bread at the Last Supper and said, This is my body, and it is his body, blood, soul, and divinity, consecrating the Eucharist, fulfilling his words, I will give you the bread of life, the true bread of life, not as your fathers ate um, in the desert. The bread of angels, the bread of life, the living bread come down from heaven. So that same powerful God spoke from the cross and said to Mary, Behold your son, and to John, Behold your mother. And those words apply to us. She is our spiritual mother, given to us by Christ when he dwells within us through faith, through the sacrament of baptism, through Holy Communion. We are one with Christ, and just as he entered our human family, we enter his divine family, and we can say, Our Father who art in heaven, and he is our Father because we are sons and daughters of God because of what Christ has done on the cross and because of the Incarnation. And so too we can say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, our mother, blessed among all women. As we go on further, we see Jesus revealing his humanity, that he is one with us. Quoting from Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And so we see Jesus pointing out to us, it's okay to cry out to God when we are in pain. He's doing it too from the cross. The agony of being on there for hours with those nails in his hands and in his feet hanging on the cross, suffering in agony. But we are called to carry the cross. We are called by Jesus. He says, you cannot be my disciple unless you deny yourself daily. Take up your cross and follow me. So we deny ourselves daily when we say no to sin and yes to prayer. That's what we are called to do, to deny ourselves the forbidden fruits of this world that we may eat of the bread of life with a clean conscience and receive the fruit that comes from the new tree of life, the cross. And the fruit of the cross is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And so the connection between the cross and the Last Supper, as I mentioned, we see powerfully connected. The first time the word priest is mentioned in Scripture in the book of Genesis, it talks about Melchizedek, who was a priest of Salem. Salem means peace. It would later be Jerusalem. And that's where Jesus is crucified. And the inscription over his head is King of the Jews. He's the King of the Jews, the King of the heavenly Jerusalem. And so it says Melchizedek, a priest of God, king of Salem. So he's a priest king. He sacrificed or offered, depending on the translation, bread and wine. And that's what Jesus does. And so the bread and the wine, the Eucharist, is what connects us to Christ. That's how we receive the benefit of the work of the new Adam and the new Eve. Christ completes his work on the cross, his, the, the power of the work of redemption. And so the fruit of the cross is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. It is the Eucharist. It is the delivery system, as it were, of the grace of God to our souls in Holy Communion. Next, we see the words, I thirst. What does he thirst for? Is it water? No. Jesus is thirsting for us to love him in return with sacrificial love as he is loving us from the cross with his greatest sacrificial love. 
that of giving his life for us. Jesus said, greater love than this no man has, that he laid down his life for his friends. I have laid down my life for you. I call you my friends, and you are my friends if you do what I command you. So again, the commandments help us stay with Christ. It makes us his friends, his brothers and sisters. It brings us into the family of God. Obedience to the command of God. So he thirsts for us to love him. The scripture also says, my soul is thirsting for, my, for the living God. We are called to thirst for him as well. Our soul should be thirsting for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or holiness. Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. And so we seek to have that within our souls, that we thirst for the love of God as he thirsts for us to return the love he showed us on the cross. Finally, the sixth word, remember, on the sixth day, God does his last creation, the creation of man and woman. And so he says here, it is finished. The sixth word of Christ from the cross, the sacrifice is finished. It is now complete. The world has been redeemed. God has done his part. And now he hands the cross back to us and says, here, it's your turn. You must do your part. I have done my part for your salvation. You take and carry the cross until the day you die, that you may receive the benefits of what I gained through shedding my precious blood on the cross for you. It is now finished, the work of redemption. The high priest has completed the sacrifice which redeems the world. The Lamb of God has been slain. And now the seventh words of Christ from the cross. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He finally leaves the body of suffering and goes with his spirit to the Father that he may now watch from heaven to see the work that he has done on the cross, to see who it will benefit and who will neglect it, who will appreciate it and love it and embrace it and grow from it and who will deny it or ignore it and not care about it. His work is finished. He commends his spirit to his Father in heaven, and from heaven he watches us to see if we will appreciate, to see if we will believe and accept and love what he has done for us at the cross. He commends his spirit to the Father. We are called to do the same. We are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are confirmed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, the sacrament of confirmation, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So our soul should be one with his Holy Spirit. We need to commend our spirit to the Father. We do not need to commend our spirit to the lies and things and, and sins of the world. The world seeks to take our spirit and defile it and take it away from the Father forever. Let us be one with Christ who says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let us commend our spirit to the Father by what we say and do, by how we live our lives, by our belief in Jesus Christ, the light of the world, the way, the truth, and the life, who said to us in today's gospel, my kingdom is not of this world. And all who are of the truth, Listen to me.